Okay, thank you all again for being here this evening. As I said a few minutes ago, my name's Allison Spindler. I'm a planner here with the City of Long Beach uh, within the Development Services Department and the Planning Bureau. Again, if you haven't already signed in, be, sh be sure to grab a save the date for our Climate Action and Adaptation Plan open house coming up next weekend. That flyer also has a link to our website. You're gonna see a lot of great material tonight. That's all gonna be available on our website as well as a recording of the event. So tonight, the city and the Department of Development Services, together with our partners, are here to talk about the very important topic of climate action and adaptation. We're developing this plan for many reasons, first of which is because we're concerned about how climate change can impact our health, safety, homes, and neighborhoods. There are also a growing number of state regulations that require us to go through this kind of planning process. And we recognize the importance of being a leader for our community and particularly our young people in beginning to think about how we will address climate change to make our city safer, healthier, and more economically vibrant in the future. Before we jump into the discussion on sea level rise, I did want to note that there are several climate stressor stressors impacting Long Beach. Tonight, of course, we will focus on sea level rise, but I actually wanted to note that um, extreme heat is predicted to, um, to impact the most number of residents in the coming years, and we need to be uh, looking at all of these issues. So we hope you will engage with us this evening in learning more from our expert panel asking questions, sharing your feedback on what we should start to do and what should we prioritize in the climate action planning process. You can share your feedback either at the boards in the back if you haven't already, through our comment cards here tonight or we have an electronic comment card on our website and also at the open house next weekend we'll have plenty of opportunity to share your feedback. We know that climate change is a global crisis that will take all of us working together to tackle. We don't have all the answers because no one does. That's why we thought it important to bring together different experts tonight so we can learn from each other and come up with the solutions that can work right here in Long Beach. We know it won't be easy, but that as a community together, we are up to the task. With that, I would like to introduce Ms. Linda Tatum, the Director of our Development Services Department, who will kick us off tonight. Good evening. I can't tell you how pleased I am with the number we've had uh, come out on this rainy um, evening on a Monday to join us. So um, my name is Linda Tatum, Director of Development Services, and uh, I'd like to first thank you for being here um, to participate in this conversation with us this evening. Um, we want to talk about, as, as um, Allison has mentioned, sea level rise, how it could impact us here in Long Beach, and what local residents and homeowners and other property owners can do to prepare for that aspect. As we've seen in recent years, um, more severe storms um, have been coming our way, and they've been leading to flooding and other impacts um, greater than they have in the past. Climate change is real. It is not some fiction of our imaginations, and according to research that's been compiled by the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health, it is already impacting our health, and also 90% of climate experts agree that human activities are the leading cause of climate change. Our mayor, um, Mayor Robert Garcia, has uh, joined another group of, of local mayors in a, um, a climate change compact Back in 2015, he joined this group of, it's called the, um, the Global Covenant of Mayors, specifically to signal not only that the city was, um, was uh, up to addressing the challenge to our local community, but also uh, we needed to join cities across the, na the, uh, across the entire nation to address this really critical issue. So by joining this compact, the mayor has not only signaled to us as a city of residents that the city needs to make a commitment to address this effort, but he also wants to show the city's leadership in this, in this uh, important and critical, on this critical topic. 
So our work, as Allison has mentioned, is uh, today we're going to be working on the CAP, uh, and that's uh, what we call it for short, the CAP. Uh, Climate Action Adaptation Plan is really a mouthful, so we call it the CAP. I hope, you, hope you'll do that too, and we can all commonly know when we say CAP, that's what we're speaking about. So you'll hear a little bit more from Allison about what our CAP involves and also the efforts that we're undertaking starting, um, we started about a year ago to uh, essentially address and prepare for it within our community. But we want to tackle these and I, I think you may have also had a chance to look at some of the boards in the back of the room that show you just what we think that um, this issue will involve and how it may potentially start to affect us here in the city. I'd like to thank our sponsors this evening uh, that participated and partners with us in this effort. That's the, um, the Long Beach chapter of the American Institute of Architects and also the Aquarium of the Pacific. Um, they're partnering us with, for this important topic tonight and will be a part of our panel. I'd also like to expend a very special thanks to Dr. Jerry Shule and Jeff Jeanette, who are um, our speakers on the panel tonight. I hope you'll take this opportunity to uh, hear from these experts and also uh, to share your questions, your comments uh, as well, and we have multiple ways for you to do that as Allison will share with you. As we, um, we, your important, your feedback will really be important to us to, as a community, collectively um, come up with a plan that will address this really important issue because, as we know, climate change will continue to impact us. I thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for your participation. And with that, um, Allison, we'll go ahead and kick off the program. Okay, so here's our agenda for tonight. We have three brief presentations to get us started. I'll talk a little bit, as Linda mentioned, about our work developing a cap, and then we'll hear from Dr. Schubel about sea level rise, and then Jeff Jeanette about how residents and homeowners can begin to prepare. After that, we have a facilitated panel discussion, but really we left the last 45 minutes the biggest part of the event for your questions. Um, and after we get through the presentations, we'll pass out note cards for those that do have questions. We know many people in the audience probably have questions, so please do begin to think about those, and we'll um, pass out the note cards and start collecting. To kick us off, just to make sure we're all on the same page, what is climate action? Well, climate action is really about reducing the impact we as people have on the climate system by reducing our future carbon emissions. You might recognize this picture, maybe one or two of us have been stuck in a traffic jam like this before, and I didn't choose this um, photo randomly, it's because our, our largest sector of greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Long Beach is from the transportation sector. On the other hand, we have climate adaptation, and that's really about reducing the impact that climate change will have on us as people by adjusting our behaviors, our systems, infrastructure, and other changes, again, to reduce that negative impact that climate change could have on us. So then what is a cap? It will be, for Long Beach, our first ever plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions citywide while also preparing for the impacts of climate change and also improving our quality of life, enhancing economic vitality um, by creating those co-benefits that climate action and adaptation can have. We all have a role to play and that's why we really need you in the process. Now before we get any further, I did wanna take a moment to thank all of our appointed and elected officials who are able to join us tonight. I understand that council member and our coastal commissioner, Roberto Uranga, is here with us this evening. Could you wave and say hello? Thank you so much for joining us. I know we had one or two other um, elected or appointed officials hoping to make it out tonight. It really means a lot to us to have you here. Um, in the conversation, council member and commissioner, and thank you uh, for your continued support. I know in your role on the Coastal Commission, this is a very important issue that you're helping to address. So there are a lot of goals related to developing our CAP. Several are listed here. Uh, we wanna be a leader in this work and also have an actionable plan that won't just sit on a shelf. We wanna develop a green economy and ensure that we get as many of the economic, social, and health benefits as we can out of addressing these issues. 
and we really want to center our young people in this process. This will be a multi-generational issue, and it's important that our young people and students are involved now, and seeing this as an opportunity to change the way we do things, both as individuals, but in terms of jobs and economy, um, what future they have. There'll be many city actions in this plan, but it's also a plan to get residents involved. This is not the beginning of our journey as a city around sustainability. This timeline just shows you how many actions we've already taken to be a leader in sustainability starting in 2006 when the port created the Cleaner Action Plan, 2007 in the formation of our Sustainable City Commission, all the way to, as Linda mentioned, um, the mayor joining the Global Covenant of Mayors. At the time, it was called the Compact of Mayors. And in 2017, incorporating our sustainable, sustainability policies in the land use element update. The CAP is actually a mitigation measure of the land use element update. So the two are very interconnected, which gets to some of the other reasons why we're developing a CAP. Um, in addition to being a leader, it's to help us meet a whole host of state regulations that compel us to develop a plan. I'm not going to read every single one on here, but there's a couple I did want to point out. So, of course, AB 32 was a landmark legislation for California, signed by the Governor Schwarzenegger at the time, that said that California would reduce its carbon emissions to 1990 levels by 2020, and it requires cities to work through our planning efforts to reduce carbon emissions by better linking housing, jobs, and transportation. And again, that's part of why, um, in planning, we're, we're spearheading this plan. We also have AB 691, which requires cities on the coast to develop and submit a plan for addressing sea level rise to the State Lands Commission. SB 1000 requires cities' general plans to incorporate adaptation strategies while also identifying disadvantaged communities and incorporating policies to reduce environmental health impacts in those communities. There's been a lot of work already done to date, but it's mostly been focused on understanding the data and information out there in terms of what is the problem that we're dealing with here. So we've done a vulnerability assessment of our critical assets here in the city, looked at um, the different climate stressors and how they can impact us here in Long Beach. We've begun to draft adaptation actions. We're looking at um, a greenhouse gas inventory. What, where are our emissions coming from? options for reducing those emissions. And a lot of that work has been really um, supported by our scientific working group. Dr. Schubel, who will speak in just a few minutes, is part of that group of 13 independent experts from Cal State Long Beach, the City College, uh, UCLA, the Aquarium, Air Quality Management District, and more, who have really ensured that the local science that's out there is incorporated into what we do. And we've also been out there talking to the community. We're having business community group meetings. We're having um, community organization group meetings. We've had over 20 CAP community events in 2018. Here are some of the ways that climate change is expected to impact us. It's going to impact our public health, our water supply, our homes and neighborhoods, our coast, our parks and open space, and then many of our infrastructure sectors around transportation, energy, wastewater, and stormwater. Here are the five climate stressors uh, projected to impact Long Beach, and many of them already are. That's poor air quality, sea level rise, flooding, drought, and extreme heat. We have a climate hazards report on our website um, that details this in, in much more depth, and our open house next weekend will, will go into depth as well. I mentioned this briefly in my opening comments. We are here to focus on sea level rise tonight, but we do want to point out the dangers around extreme heat. The projections show that historically, between 1980 and 2000, we had four extreme heat days a year. That's days where it's over 95 degrees. By mid-century, that could be between 11 and 16 days a year, and by end of century, 37 days a year. It's also going to not get as cool at night, so that nighttime cooling effect won't sort of protect us like it has in the past. And we have um, over 275,000 Long Beach residents in the highest vulnerability zone to extreme heat. Extreme heat can cause heat-related illness like heat stroke or even death. It can also cause vector-borne issues as well, and particularly children, older, adult, older adults, and those that already have respiratory issues are the most impacted by extreme heat. 
You might remember the power outage we had here in Long Beach a few summers ago um, when it was an extreme heat wave. That's also an example of where climate change and emergency preparedness uh, really come together. This map shows you where the most vulnerable extreme heat areas are in our city. They're in red. Here are some of the examples of things we could do about extreme heat in terms of adapting, including creating shade structures at bus shelters or at parks, expanding our cooling centers and public water supply. Again, we don't have time to go into detail tonight, but we'll have much more information next weekend at our open house. And we hope you'll weigh in. Next, of course, is our flooding impacts. Our other panelists will get into more detail, but the aquarium's research in 2015 showed that by 2050, with our uh, anticipated 24 inches of sea level rise, in addition to a coastal storm, we could see about 22,000 residents impacted. And flooding, of course, can cause issues from sewage overflow to damage to our infrastructure systems, challenges in terms of food and water supply, disruption to transportation, which also disrupts our, our ability to provide those emergency services that are so critical. Here is where um, riverine or, or um, precipitation-based flooding could happen in the city. In blue would be a 100-year flood. In orange, a very large 500-year storm event. And again, Dr. Schubel will get into more detail on our sea level rise impacts, but this data is on our website. Um, similar impacts to what we just discussed. Here, is a, here are some of the maps you saw in the back. Projections for sea level rise in our downtown area. In purple is with 11 inches of sea level rise anticipated by about 2030. The darkest blue is with 24 inches in 2050. The light, and then the lighter blues look at the two 2100 scenarios. Here in West Long Beach um, are some anticipated flooding impacts from sea level rise. One thing in our favor there is that the port already has an adaptation plan that could help mitigate a lot of what we're seeing here. I know you heard this in the back with the posters, but these are all under what we call no action scenarios. So if we were to do nothing about this issue, that's why we're all here today, because we do need to, to act collectively. And then here is the map for East Long Beach. Again, the, the purple is for 2030, darkest blue for 2050 projections, and the two lighter blues are a mid-range and high-range scenario for 2100. Here are some examples of the things we can do about it. This is just a start, and again, we'll need all of you involved in helping us to prioritize, to think about how we could implement this together. Some will be city or government actions, others will be things that homeowners and residents can do, um, and it'll be really important to have you all involved in the process. I also want to talk very briefly about climate mitigation, reducing our future impact so that we're not contributing more to this problem. Here are the main sectors that we have emissions from, from building energy and transportation to our waste sectors. Here's a pie chart that's also on our website. As I mentioned, over half of our emissions in the city of Long Beach come from transportation, followed by about 45% from the buildings that we turn on the lights, use heating and cooling systems, followed by our waste sector. We're considering a lot of potential greenhouse gas reduction targets, but the point of this slide is to show that no matter which we select, the trajectory has to go way down. Here are some examples of the types of mitigations we could do on the transportation side. Again, you'll have opportunities to weigh in at the open house next weekend and online. One thing to note is that some of the mitigations we consider can also have co-benefits on the adaptation side. I talked earlier about uh, shade structures at bus shelters. That could also help us um, make riding the bus a more pleasant experience and therefore help us reduce our transportation emissions. So in terms of next steps, again, that open house next weekend will kick off a 30-day public comment period on the draft actions. Up to now, we've really been looking at what does the data tell us about the problem. Now we have to work together to identify the solutions, prioritize them, and figure out how we can make them happen. We hope to have a draft plan by March that you can all take a look at and weigh in on again. And here are the details for next Saturday. We'll be at the Michelle Obama Library. Lots of different stations where you can look at each emission sector and adaptation need, where you can weigh in, get your feedback, see a more detailed presentation, and hear from some sustainability resources across the city. 
please visit our website. It's going to have um, all the presentations from tonight, a video from tonight, and has all the maps you've seen. Um, and it's on the back of that Save the Date card you all received when you walked in. Our tagline is small change, big impact. These are big issues, but together we can do something about it. We hope you'll join us. And with that, I'd like to call up Dr. Schubel from the Aquarium for his presentation. Thank you, Allison. Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to give you my high-level takeaway messages first, and then I will explain some of them. So sea level rise is a global problem, as you've heard from Allison. It's one that's mediated in our area by tides, by waves, by El Ninos, by Paci the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO, and by movements of the Earth's crust. Down here, our crust is sinking at about a millimeter a year. We need to distinguish between temporary flooding and permanent inundation. Temporary flooding is happening now, and permanent inundation is something that uh, we can look forward to in a few decades because of sea level rise. Sea level is rising. It's rising at an accelerated rate, and it will continue to rise throughout the remainder of this century and well beyond no matter what we do. Because of the large inventory of CO2 already in the atmosphere, sea level rise is baked in. We've committed ourselves and our descendants to living in a warmer world with a higher sea level. Now, the amount that sea level will rise will be determined by how rapidly and how much we reduce greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, CO2. And the only way to really do that is to reduce CO2 emissions. And the best way to do that is to move away from fossil fuels. We're already experiencing what's called sunny day coastal flooding. It occurs when storms conspire with high tides, king tides, El Ninos, uh, and we can expect to see these increase in frequency and intensity as sea level rises. So when you superimpose these episodic short-term flooding events on an increasingly higher stand of sea level, the problems are exacerbated. Tom Lehrer, the musician, songwriter, and mathematician once said, always predict the worst and you will be hailed as a prophet. So with that good news, let's talk a little bit about causes and consequences. Sea level has been rising for the last 18,000 years. This is a chart of sea level rise starting at the beginning of the end of the last glacial, and it rose rapidly until about 7,000 years ago. It leveled off, and it didn't rise very much until about 150 years ago. And most coastal development around the country and around the world took place during this period of stable sea level. We got lulled into the attractiveness of living close to the, close to the ocean, and now we have to be concerned about that. So what happened? Well, what happened was that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up dramatically since the end of the industrial, or since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And if you go back to uh, 1800 or so, sea level uh, rise has accompanied this increase in CO2. And CO2 has increased by about 250%. The Earth has already warmed by about 8 tenths of a degree Celsius, according to NASA, and uh, it's, it's continuing to go up. So this is the annual mean in black and the five-year running mean in red, and you can see that there has been this increase in temperature. And as, as the temperature has gone up, the ocean has also warmed when you warm a liquid, it expands, the ocean has expanded, and that contributes to sea level rise. And also when you increase the temperature, continental ice melts and that water goes back into the ocean, causing sea level to rise. The big two 800-pound gorillas are Greenland and Antarctica. If all of Antarctica were to melt, sea level would go up by 200 feet. If all of Greenland were to melt, sea level would go up by about 20 feet. Now, that has never happened in the 200,000 years of human history, and it would take thousands of years to happen, 
but it has happened in the geologic past, and this is something scientists worry about. Once you put CO2 into the atmosphere, it stays there for a long time. This is the problem. 50% of it stays for decades, 30% of it stays for centuries, and 20% of it stays for millennia. So our future sea level rise is pretty well baked in. <clears throat> and as I already mentioned, though, the amount that it will rise is a function of how rapidly and how much we reduce CO2. The problem is we're on the wrong trajectory. After, if you look at Paris, in 2017, global emissions increased about 1.4%, and they increased again in 2018. Last year, U.S. emissions went up by 3.4%. So we're on the wrong trajectory. And if you look at China, which is responsible for about one quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, last year, in 2017 rather, their emissions went up by 1.7%. It was fueled by ra rapid economic growth and an increase in their use of coal, oil, and natural gas. And the, the rest, this is where two-thirds of all of the greenhouse gas emissions come from in the increases in Asia. And <clears throat> that's going to continue because there are an awful lot of poor people there, and energy is the best way out of poverty. So where does California stand in all this? Well, we are a leader in reducing greenhouse gas emissions for electrical generation by shifting from, uh, from fossil fuels to both solar and wind. I think we may very well regret our move away from nuclear, but that's a topic for an another time. And we also, though, we need to tackle transportation in a serious way in this state. And if you remember last year's wildfires, they accounted for enough CO2 to equal all of the CO2 emitted by the entire transportation sector. That's about one third of all of our emissions. So if you put California in perspective, globally we emit somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And the atmosphere has a mixing time of less than a year. So we may be the fifth largest economy. And we in this room, and I'm one of them, think everything good begins and ends in California. When it comes to climate change, we're, we don't play the major role. Now, we can play a leadership role, and that's important. But we share the atmosphere with everybody else, so we're going to have the same atmosphere as China and Indonesia and India. I think at some point, we're going to have to recognize to re that we have to reset the atmosphere to an earlier period. And the only way you do that is to remove CO2 from the atmosphere that's already there and lock it away somewhere underground. Now, people get troubled by this because it's a form of geoengineering, and it is. But I like to think of it as, for 200 years, we've been polluting the atmosphere, and now we have a responsibility to clean it up. And I strongly believe that. Now, what about for those people who live on the peninsula in Naples? And again, I would urge you, we need to distinguish between periodic, episodic flooding which is temporary, and permanent inundation, which results from long-term sea level rise. These require different responses. I think with proper planning and willingness to be open to a variety of solutions, including hard solutions in combination with soft solutions, I think residents in these areas can live quite comfortably on the peninsula or in Naples for several decades as long as you're ready to be experience occasional flooding. Now, everybody knows what this is, and you might ask, how long is this strategy going to work? <laughs> maybe, maybe for a couple of decades, maybe a little longer if you combine it with an engineering solution that I think should be looked at seriously, such as a tow jetty 
A tow jetty is a short jetty, and you put it down to intercept that sand so that it doesn't go all the way down, and you have to truck it back with the truck almost every day of the year. I think if we did that, we would keep much of the sand in place, and it would improve the quality of life of many of the residents along here. Over the longer term, we need a different strategy. There isn't room on the peninsula and much of Naples to retreat. On the peninsula, there's no space, and the highest elevation is seven feet. And in Naples, there's so much development, where do you retreat to? But retreat is going to be a strategy in the US and the world. It's not a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of prudence to plan for it. Now, the last time, this, and this is, these are 400,000 years before the present. Here's the present. There's current CO2. This is when human beings, modern human beings, homo sapiens, first appeared. So we have never seen a level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as high as we have now. And in fact, be, if, to see that, you have to go back three to five million years. It was a geological epoch called the Pliocene, megatooth. Sharks prowled the oceans. Sea level was 130 feet higher than today. Average temperature, seven and maybe higher. And, and these guys were uh, swimming around Huntington Beach. <laughs> As we pass this, this is what climate scientists worry about. It has happened before. Now, there were no humans around. What caused the big CO2? Probably excessive volcanic activity. There was a very important article in Nature on the 5th of December by three very distinguished scientists. And they say, we have to be even more concerned because all of this is going to happen more rapidly than anybody has told us, than, than more rapidly than the IPCC reports. And they said for, for these three reasons, greenhouse gas emissions are still rising instead of going down, air quality is improving. Now, that sounds strange, but the cleaner the air, the more solar radiation reaches the Earth's surface, it gets absorbed, and it gets re-radiated as long wave radiation, and the CO2 keeps it from going back into space. And we are entering a warm period of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Along this area, we've been in, in the cold phase, and so our sea level rise has been less than the global average, and that, we believe, is, a, believe is about to change. They moved, remember in Paris, the aspirational goal was one and a half degrees Celsius. And the, the real goal, to keep below two degrees Celsius, that was what was felt necessary to prevent irreparable damage. They've moved the boundary to get to one and a half degrees up to 2030. That's not very far away. And they moved the two degrees Celsius boundary up to 2045. That's only 26 years away. And in terms of sea level, they predicted that by 2050, we could have a global rise of sea level of two to three feet, and that by 2100, it could be seven to 10 feet. Those are frightening figures that we have to deal with. So what do we do? It's time now certainly is to act. We need, it's a global problem, we do need to adapt. We need to keep an open mind to all options. I, include, I think it includes hard and soft solutions. I'm an environmental, sci environmental scientist and a lot of environmentalists are against hard solutions. And there's some reason for that. But we're going to have to be very creative in combining soft solutions, nature's way, with some selected engineering solutions. I think we need to make a plan for an orderly exit from the coast in these areas like the peninsula and Naples within a few decades. You can elevate your home, but you still have to get to your home and you have to have services. So putting your home on stilts isn't a very good answer, at least not for very long. You know, we, we have been engineering our climate for 200 years, we've been doing it without purpose, 
without any forethought, without any, any intentionality. Wouldn't it seem that the most creative species ever to live on this planet could begin to engineer our future within purpose and intentionality with all appropriate respect for nature? And H.L. Mencken was a very famous journalist in Baltimore where we lived for many years. He wrote for the Baltimore Sun, and he was always good for a quote. I like this one. For every human situation, there is a simple solution, neat, plausible, and wrong. We all look for silver bullets, simple solutions, and there aren't any. These are problems that are called wicked problems. They don't fall within any, within any discipline. They cross all disciplinary bounds. You can't solve them, but if you're clever enough, if you formulate them properly, you can manage them to keep them, their effects within bounds and to minimize what the Rand Corporation calls regret. That's what we need to do with climate change, and um, I think that should be our goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schubel. Uh, next, I'll call up uh, local architect Jeff Jeanette of Jeanette Architects. And I did want to make a quick note. It was an important distinguished, um, distinguishing point that uh, Dr. Schubel made between temporary flooding and more permanent flooding. And the maps that I did show is not until 2100 that we would see a daily high tide flooding. Hopefully, you got to see in more detail in the back. But we're really looking at once or twice a year or during a large storm before then. So OK, thank you. Thank you, Allison. It's good to see everybody here. Great turnout for a, a rainy afternoon, evening is uh, something great. Um, I'm Jeff Jeanette. I started Jeanette Architects with a mission to craft beautiful homes for families just like you, help you through the building process and uh, remodeling and new home construction throughout primarily Long Beach. Tonight, I'd like to introduce you to strategies we've implemented over the last 18 years designing and remodeling homes in the floodplains. The first thing to know is that water will win. We can't fight it. Just as uh, Dr. Schubel mentioned, it's coming. We're going to get flooded, and we need to act as soon as we possibly can to mitigate some of these conditions that are on our, our horizons. We don't design to prevent floodwaters from getting in. We actually work with them. Nearly 9% of the homes in the US are in flood hazard zones. That equates to nearly 41 million people that are located within these zones that are susceptible to the climate change that we're, that's upon us. Uh, most of you live in the Belmont Shore, Belmont Park, Naples, and Peninsula areas where we have a base flood elevation of 10 feet. Base flood elevation is defined <clears throat> as a height in feet above sea level that floodwaters may rise in a 100-year storm event. In Long Beach, our, our BFE, base flood elevation, is at 10. FEMA sets a minimum elevation at 9, and the city of Long Beach has adopted an additional one foot which offers homeowners better protection and reduce flood insurance premiums. When I visit a home in a floodplain, the first thing I look for is the height difference between the curb and the home's floor. This is a pretty simple thing to, to, to visualize. If I find that the elevations are similar, I can have a pretty good assumption that the home is probably below the floodplain in which case we're going to be looking for mitigation measures depending on the, uh, the scope of work and what we're going to be doing. I can tell some of you are asking yourselves, well, how do I know if my home is actually in the floodplain? Maps can tell us that. But how do I know if it's below the base floodplain elevation of that 10-foot level? Well, the easiest way to do this and the most trusting way is to actually have a civil engineer or a uh, land surveyor survey the property 
and determine exactly how high your, your finished floor sits in our region. If it's above 10, then we're in the clear. If it's below, then we're looking at uh, conditions that we need, need to pay attention to. Tonight, we have a, a civil engineer here in the back from Cal Surveys that can uh, ask or can answer any questions that you might have specific to those. Looking at this elevation certificate here, 10.7 represents the foot in elevation for the finished floor itself. Most homes we encounter are below the base flood elevation, so mitigation practices are actually necessary. Here are two extreme examples of flood protection, neither of which we can actually do here, but they're kind of fun to look at and consider. Uh, the top one is dirt berming, which is hard to get away with in our area unless you can talk your neighbor into borrowing an expanse of their land and uh, grabbing some of that, that space. The bottom one, this example shows a home on concrete piles that uh, Dr. Schubel had mentioned. These are some of the only mitigation levels that we can look at in today's uh, construction options. Uh, the picture represents a storm that hit Mexico, Mexico Beach, uh, Florida back in October of 2018. And this was one of the only homes that really truly made it through the, uh, the hurricanes that came through. So the best way to protect our homes today from the sea level rise is to raise it above that base flood elevation, providing peace of mind during flood events and reduce flood insurance premiums. One way is to lift the home by installing steel beams and slowly jacking it up. This allows us to raise the home to any height necessary and prepare your underfloor area for new foundations and utilities that will be going in afterwards. Foundation walls are then extended to meet the bottom of the floor framing and new flood water openings are created. The home is then bolted to the foundation and utilities reconnected. Those utilities uh, under floor area typically include uh, plumbing, and some electrical conditions. <clears throat> Depending on how high the, the home is raised, the area underneath can be used for building access, parking, or storage, but not as livable square footage. Flood vents are an excellent way to prevent uh, damage to the home. Smart vent is one product that we have been specifying for quite a number of years. Uh, Clay Goodrich from SmartVent is here in the back as well. I can answer some questions about their products, flood proofing homes, and also answer questions about insurance. Clay and SmartVent also have a flood risk evaluation service that can help uncover vulnerabilities and help craft mitigation uh, conditions. So definitely somebody that you'll want to touch base with uh, later this evening. Flood vents are required in most coastal regions for homes. They're installed around perimeter walls of homes and garages, allowing water to pass through the floor area. While this seems counterintuitive, it's actually one of the best ways to reduce damage to your home. Hydrostatic pressures, as water pushes against a wall, are very strong. So when water can pass through, the home may be pushed off its foundations or float due to the science behind buoyancy. Flood vents equalize hydrostatic pressures between the outside and underfloor areas, creating a balance in and out, which minimizes the structural damage that can affect. Protecting wood framing materials in crawl spaces is important. We recommend using a sprayer and a penetrating wood sealer on all underfloor wood areas, providing longevity and durability to the underfloor area. It's best to use a non-organic materials below the floodplain, such as cement backerboard, concrete, pressure treated wood, marine grade plywood, and water resistant fasteners. 
Painting all these materials with an acrylic latex paint can also help add an, uh, an additional level of protection. A better and more complete option to seal your underfloor area is by removing that old bat insulation, if you still have any, and replacing it with spray foam insulation. Spray foam provides an air and water barrier to protect the wood and an excellent insulation qualities to help increase energy efficiency and interior comfort. It turns into an actual threefer when it comes to uh, installing it. It can be a little bit more expensive, uh, but to do it today versus later on, it really helps in the long run. Foundation retrofits, or bolting your home to the foundation, is advised to strengthen connections of the home that get wet during flood events. It counteracts that buoyancy effect mentioned earlier and can also help in earthquake conditions, like holding that home and the, the, uh, the sill plates of the floors down to the concrete foundations. It's important to move all mechanical equipment out of basements. They're lower than the flood elevation and there's no stopping water that will inevitably enter. Damaging equipment and creating secondary hazards is not a good idea. Anchoring equipment to your home or concrete pads is the best way to keep them from floating away. Tank water heaters and other gas-fired appliances, including dryers, should be installed above the base flood elevation. Often we'll remove old tank water heaters and install tankless water heaters since they increase our home's efficiency, reduce utility bills, and easily bolt to walls above the floodplain elevation. The swap out isn't too bad from an expense standpoint as well. In garages, ground fault circuit interrupt electrical outlets, the ones that have that little button, should be installed above the base flood elevation or around 48 inches above the floor. This keeps them out of the, the water as they come in, as it comes in. These outlets will trip when the water uh, arrives and are required in garages and exterior locations just in general for the code. As gas a gas-powered backup generator uh, is also another item that you might want to consider for future use should uh, we lose power during one of these events. <clears throat> Something that's easy to do is to keep your gutters and downspouts clean. Slope your exterior grade away from the home to help with the site drainage as well. We like permeable concrete and pavers at driveways and walkways. They allow water to seep back into the ground as floodwaters receive and also help with the day-to-day -day drainage within uh, our lowlands. Another way to prepare your home is to ask a plumber to install a mainline sewer backflow preventer that can help keep sewer water from backing up into your home. You can uh, kind of think about what that looks like and it's not something that's very pretty. We've seen a couple of instances and it's extremely damaging. A sump pump is a device used to remove water from low-lying areas or basements. Plugging them into electrical outlets above the base flood elevation or that backup generator is a good idea. Portable sump pumps should be used to clear out water after a flood event. And uh, crawl space fans can be installed in the uh, crawl space area to help with uh, air movement and also reduce some of the concerns that you would, might have for mold as the floodwaters recede as well. Where possible, keep the contents of your garage off the floor as water will enter and damage valuables that are stored too low. Some of this sounds kind of uh, intuitive but not things that people often think about. If you suspect a rising tide or flood coming, prepare your home by turning off the power at your electric meter, shut off your gas meter, and the water at the street. This will help mitigate a lot of the secondary effects that uh, utilities can have after they've been damaged in flood conditions. Sandbags and expandable floodgates may be used to help prevent water from getting in through doors or cracks in foundations. Get out now and think about what you might be able to 
secure in your home or garage in preparation of some of these elements. By preparing your home for rising tides and flood events, you can reduce your flood insurance premiums and physical damage to your most valuable investment, your home. For additional information, uh, you might want to take a look at the FEMA.gov website. It's got a multitude of excellent information that uh, us as homeowners can actually understand. <clears throat> Smartvent.com is another great resource. Uh, searching online, flood proofing your home, and anything similar to that brings up a lot of great information that can help. And of course, don't hesitate to call your local friendly neighborhood licensed professionals at Jeanette Architects. <laughs> we'll help you through it all. Great, and now I'll invite Dr. Subal back up and ask um, Jeff as well to come on up to the to the stage in about five minutes. Our staff are gonna start passing out note cards for those of you that have questions. We're gonna do a few um, questions here on the panel discussion first, and then we'll start collecting your uh, questions as well. So I'm gonna start with the question. Um, if you were a homeowner, homeowner here in East Long Beach and um, you're seeing the information you're seeing today, what is the first step you would take to prepare? I know, Jeff, you gave us a lot of great uh, steps. What would be kind of the first action you would take? Definitely the first thing we'd want to take a look at is that flood elevation certificate. Thank you. Definitely the first thing we want to really look at is where our home sits relative to the base flood elevation. So contacting a local civil engineer or land surveyor in order to determine what that elevation looks like is a key important is key part to getting started. After that, we can start to determine what measures need to be uh, set in place based off of any work that you're gonna plan on doing uh, from a construction standpoint or from just a general uh, concern for mitigating future problems with the uh, flood and rising tides. Okay, and um, we talked about this a little bit, but how can you design a garage to occasionally flood? What are some of the materials? And I know one question we'll probably get is, what kind of cost people might be thinking of? The garages uh, all, of, uh, all around us are in the lowlands. Uh, they're the lowest portion because they're connected to the streets and we can't necessarily raise them for any reasons. So the best way to really truly uh, protect the contents is to get them up off the floor. Uh, raising, uh, garages are gonna be flooding no matter what. They're, uh, the vents that are gonna be installed are gonna allow that water to come through. Uh, installation of the flood vents themselves is dependent on the overall scale and size of your home. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but some of the other measures about raising your home, uh, those costs can range anywhere from fifty to $75,000, depending on what the makeup of the home is, the square footage, and in general, what needs to be connected and reconnected. After we raise a home, we're also looking at uh, the damage that was caused by just physically doing it. So stucco is gonna crack, uh, you're gonna have crack inside of plaster walls, drywall walls, so a lot of those conditions, we're gonna need to go back in and actually patch, repaint, and then get it back up to, to snuff. So I, I would, I guess if I faced that problem, I'd call Jeff. But the other thing I would do, you know, we're always after an event. We're always preoccupied with getting things back to normal as quickly as possible. And in this world, with the rising sea and climate change, we need to be thinking of dealing with what has become the new normal. And so I would encourage anybody, after you've gone through several of these, think about how long you can tolerate this. Because sea level is, is rising. It's rising more rapidly than any of the predictions. And some of these data have, are, have only come out within the last two or three months. So think about the future. 
Thank you. And I know many of you are giving us questions. Be sure to um, pass them back to the aisle to our staff members who are going to kind of collect and organize them by theme so we can try to get to uh, everyone's question tonight. So my next question is uh, for both of you. As we think a bit longer term, so say over the next 20 or 30 years, because a minute ago we were talking sort of immediate, but over the next 20 or 30 years, what are the kinds of options homeowners in sea level rise vulnerability zones like we're seeing here in East Long Beach um, and portions of West Long Beach uh, should think about? Um, what else would you suggest in that medium term? Well, as, as I mentioned in my comments, I think over the next few decades, you need to be thinking about moving. Um, and and uh, that, that's not a very pleasant thought. But so over the next 20 years, think about who your least favorite relative is and then try to sell them your house. <laughs> that's probably the wisest decision. <laughs> the, uh, the ties are coming. Uh, there's no no way to prevent that. We can only at this point do uh, quick mitigation considerations that uh, try to vent it back out into the neighborhoods, if you will, after they've receded. So what it comes down to, the long-term elements of sea level rise, it's going to happen. We just need to figure out what we can do from the standpoint of the today conditions. And I think uh, all in all, this is going to be a case-by-case -case basis as time goes by. Fortunately, not everything is going to happen tomorrow. We've got a lot of time to prepare for it. So uh, the mitigation measures that I had mentioned with respect to preparing your home, these are all things that we can do soon and consider in the future, too. And I'll just add to that. Um, Dr. Schubel showed a, showed a picture of, or maybe it was Jeff showed a picture of a home uh, that's sort of an island. Uh, so of course on the city side, we also are looking at, oh yeah, it was Jeff's, looking at elevating you know, our streets, our curbs. We of course are looking at those um, public assets as well as we also try to facilitate this conversation about what property, property owners um, can be doing and what we can be doing collectively. So it will take that sort of multi-pronged action to understand where are our vulnerabilities, how do we begin to address them, and what are all the options on the table, whether it's elevating or relocating certain things, whether it's um, making more re resilient infrastructure, and even in the, in the short term, looking at sort of our flood event notification programs, those kind of um, actions will be critical as well. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit more, a couple of examples that you all have seen or heard where a community has successfully prepared for sea level rise. Um, if you really can't think of a successful one, maybe some other sort of anecdotes of, of what's happened in other communities, but we do want to focus on, you know, what works in other places, and we know that cities can be living laboratories for innovation and trying things out, and we want to make sure we're learning from uh, other examples um, that you might know of. Well, let, let's see. I guess I would look at uh, Cape Canaveral and uh, Satellite Beach, which is near Cape Canaveral. They're, they're on an area similar to the peninsula, and they've begun making plans to, to retreat. Uh, if you look at some of the small communities in Alaska, Shivsmaref is the most famous of them. Now, those communities are only a few hundred people, and there's a lot of space, so they're able to locate, relocate, and they are in the process of doing that. Um, in Southern California, uh, Del Mar has looked at the possibility of, of retreat. It's tough there because there's so much development. Imperial Beach is another one. So there are some examples of you can stand and fight but only for so long, and so while you're doing that, then you need to be looking at options for relocation. I think the relocation comments are probably, again, right in line when it comes to long term. Uh, most of the cities that we look at that have had flood events, near, um, Florida, New Orleans, uh, lots of these areas that have been hit, they come back resilient with a lot of these mitigation measures that we talked about today. A lot of them are not in earthquake prone zones. So it's a little bit different from our standpoint because as we 
uh, have, to have to consider the seismic effects, we can't very easily get homes built on stilts. Uh, there's a whole lot of engineering associated with it. So when it comes down to uh, following in somebody else's footsteps, California actually has some different conditions that we need to deal with. Great. So we're starting to get back some of your questions in the audience. Please do continue to uh, bring them back and share with us um, what your interests or concerns are or questions might be for the panel. It looks like um, one of our questions is related to um, building uh, the new Belmont pool. So it looks like we have several folks interested or concerned about that issue. So kind of a, a few points uh, along that. So um, maybe we can bring back the vulnerability map. I'm not sure if that's easy to do, but you see them in the back. Uh, and a couple things to point out. The first is that the Cosmo scenarios that we're looking at here kind of give you that regional scale. And when you look at the vulnerability maps we have here, they're very high level, right? They're that regional kind of estimate for a very, for something that's very project specific, like the Belmont cool Pool, much more detailed analysis had to go into understanding the sea level rise projections for that, uh, for that asset. And if you've taken a look at the environmental review and assessment, again, there had to be sort of a lot more detail there. Um, for projected future sea level rise conditions in the year 2100, the ocean does not reach that structure perimeter um, due to sea level rise alone, but it would with a storm condition. So remember, Dr. Schubel earlier talked about the difference between sort of permanent inundation and a temporary flooding event. And when we do have a temporary flooding event, like we're talking about here, that's where adaptation can really play a part. Um, so if you're familiar with kind of what was done on that project, there is a, a plinth along the perimeter and the structure's been designed for this condition, including a deep foundation, uh, foundation piles to support the entire pool even if there was that loss of foundation. So many of the slides you saw in terms of the physical adaptation strategies that were talked about tonight have, have been employed in that um, project design. And so um, just wanna kind of summarize that even with the worst case conditions, it would be unlikely that the ocean would even reach that facility, but it does have adaptation measures incorporated into it. Um, okay, so the next question is, will the city of Long Beach raise the existing sea walls? along the Bay Shore, the peninsula, and other sea walls in Belmont Shore? If so, when and who pays? So that's a really great question. Um, and that's really the point that we're at in this process. And so, so far we've really been focused on what is the data and, um, and science tell us about the issue. Now we do have to come up with what those adaptation strategies will be. Um, as it's insinuated, I think, in the question, that is um, potentially something that's expensive, but would, we will need to research together and understand what the options are and what the options for financing and funding might be. You know, we don't have an unlimited pool of resources, of course, as a city or as individuals. And so understanding what the financial options are, how we could make that happen in both the near and long term will be uh, an important part. And I don't know if you want to say anything more about sea level walls or a pool. Well, I think it's largely a, a political decision, but it should be informed by the best science, science that one can muster. And I think while all of these measures are very expensive, you also have to ask, what if we don't do anything? What's the cost? How much damage and to property and, and lives and, and so on? So that's a, that's a tough question. Yeah, I don't know that I have an answer on that one. <laughs> Okay, another question is, will the city have services available for lower income residents to assist with climate actions? Will these be at reach to get information about uh, these life, health, and property um, events to vulnerable populations? So that's a really um, excellent question. And definitely in the, in the potential mitigations or adaptations we're looking at, we need to focus on our most vulnerable communities first and how to help equip and assist them in these issues. Obviously, we have different kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, but for example, we know that the South Coast Air Quality Management District has a, a buyback program for um, dirty cars for low-income residents. We're looking at, is there a way we can help bring that uh, 
you know, even stronger to Long Beach and maybe support it further with some kind of local match. Um, we're looking at, again, sort of in terms of the extreme heat in particular, which that and air quality are expected to impact our most vulnerable populations, looking at what um, co-benefits we can do on both the mitigation and adaptation side. So for example, uh, tree planting or new shade structures, as well as expanding our free and available um, um, heat, thank you, extreme heat um, centers or cooling centers for those heat issues. But certainly what we know from climate change is it will impact different people differently. You saw the maps in terms of geography of who's impacted, but we also know from research that, for example, um, those that may not have as many socioeconomic resources, it's harder to sort of um, deal with an extreme weather event to sort of kind of get away. And so providing those city resources. We learned a lot, for example, from the power outages a couple summers ago in downtown Long Beach where we had, um, you know, week-long or longer times where we had high rises with seniors on the fifth or sixth floor who could not get up or down because the elevators were out, couldn't keep medication refrigerated. We just heard a story this morning of an apartment building where the water tank was on the roof and they almost lost access to water because they didn't have electricity for so long. So those are the kinds of um, issues where climate change and emergency preparedness come together and we do need to look at how we do our emergency response and public health uh, responses in the city differently in order to make sure we're fully supporting our most vulnerable populations. Any other thoughts on what the city can do or what you've seen in other places? Well, I think sustainability often is cast in, in the form only of environmental sustainability, and yet sustainability has to have social and economic dimensions. And this is a very expensive state to live in, and we have a very large and growing population of people who have trouble making a go of it in California. So we simply have to, and many of them live in, the, in vulnerable areas, not on the peninsula, mind you, but we have to figure out ways to help them. The other comment, you talked about trees. Trees, trees are wonderful. They reduce the heat island effect, they remove uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and uh, they clean the air. My question is, why are we cutting down so many of our big, beautiful trees in Long Beach? Thank you. Um, so this question is, We just had a request if some folks in the back can try to keep the volume down a little bit. We're having some people that are in the audience still having a hard time hearing the question and answer, and we do want to make sure that people's questions get addressed. So if in the back by the boards, we could keep it a little bit quieter until we're done with the formal programming, we would really appreciate it. Um, so we have a question uh, for both Jerry and Jeff here, and I'm going to have to show you, uh, someone drew um, a nice little sketch up for us, so I'm going to have to share it here, but it says, why not build a lock between the jetties like the Panama Canal? And here is the <laughs> sketch. This is an architectural question. Uh, <laughs> it's more of a uh, land planning consideration, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> not quite sure as an architect how to, in, uh, how to uh, respond to this one, but um, the, the concept of a lock is a, a gateway that, that holds water back from certain spaces. Um, the expense, I think, would be extreme, that's for sure, um, but the concept is great. Uh, I think it's something that, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, cities in uh, Europe have actually looked at seriously, uh, but I don't know that uh, anything has been 100% implemented as of yet. But that's what Venice does, and New York City is seriously considering it after Sandy. They have formal proposals, they have estimates, and um, again, the cost is huge, but when you look at the cost of not protecting lower Manhattan, um, it changes the dynamics. 
Thank you both. And I think um, it's important to note we may not have the resources to do that tomorrow, but that is part of this process. So as you saw in the maps, uh, we're looking at temporary flooding between now and 2050 and a little bit longer. The, it's the permanent inundation that's sort of a different beast, as uh, Dr. Schubel pointed out. So it does give us some time to think about do we need to start putting funds away for some of these bigger potential interventions. And yes, it would obviously take a lot more study and understanding of what it would take and the costs and what the benefits could be and that full sort of cost benefit analysis, but something potentially to look into uh, further. And I would just, I, I think we have several decades, but the, the accelerated uh, warming and sea level rise scenarios suggest that we don't have until 2100. Thank you, and to your point, there's more of that science coming out, you know, daily and weekly to this, to this um, issue. So another question is, are homes built on fill more vulnerable to floods? Will they be damaged more? And what is the effect of the current breakwater? Sorry, those are two questions. Uh, the effect of the breakwater, I'm not really personally sure of. Maybe uh, Dr. Schubel can answer that one. Uh, building a home on, on fill versus non-fill uh, doesn't necessarily have much of an effect on the rising tides itself. Uh, what you're looking at is the stability of the soil, conditions that are below the, uh, the foundations themselves. Sand uh, is a good material when, it is, uh, when it's planned for from the very beginning in the foundation conditions. Uh, there's different types of foundations that happen uh, to be designed in sandy, silty, or liquefaction type of soil. And that's, that's where we really take a look at each project uh, separately to determine what makes sense from a foundation design standpoint based off of the uh, soil conditions. And the breakwater does provide some protection against sea level rise and storm waves. It wouldn't provide any protection at all for tsunamis, um, but it, it, was, it was built for a purpose and it, in many ways it has served that purpose. And, and the one downside, though, well, I guess there are two. If you're a surfer, it took the surf away from Long Beach. The other downside is that it increased the residence time of water inside the breakwater, so water quality gets compromised because of discharge from the LA River. There are ways, though, to in, enhance water quality, and I know the city is, is looking at, at those. Thank you. This next question asks, how do I raise my slab on grade home? It's difficult. <laughs> uh, what you're dealing with is a, uh, a concrete slab that is not designed to take the loads and pressures of being lifted. It's designed to take, take the pressures of the earth underneath it as a positive uh, uh, background, essentially, of the weight of the home itself uh, above it. So there are ways to do it uh, when you've got slab on grade conditions, whereby we would keep the existing slab there, build a top of the existing slab, and then continue walls above that. Uh, we have, we personally haven't done this, but there has been uh, studies about taking a slab raising it, seeing what kind of condition it happens to be after the, uh, uh, the work that's been done, and they just don't have the strength. They're not designed to be able to uh, support the weight of a home as well as uh, the steel beams and everything that uh, we saw in some of the earlier slides to support the, uh, the, the overall weight. But the easiest way from a slab on grade standpoint is to build to the uh, base flood elevation, either wood frame or increase it with uh, additional concrete and then raise everything above that. Okay, this question's for Dr. Schubel. Um, could you move some of the geoengineering soft and hard solutions the city is looking at? Could I name, is it move or oh, name? Oh, I think it's name, thank what? you. Yeah. 
I'm not sure the city is looking at these. Geoengineering solutions, they fall into two general categories. There's what's called CDR, carbon dioxide removal. That's where you remove carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere and lock it away. You can do it by planting trees. You can do it by planting wetlands. Those are a form of geoengineering. It would be soft engineering. Or you can do it through mechanical and chemical means, and those have been done successfully in the laboratory, but not at any scale that would yet work yet globally. So that's an area where we need to do research. The other category is called SRM, solar radiation management. That's where you inject into the upper atmosphere aerosols or small particles to reflect away incoming sunlight. And we know following major volcanic eruptions like Min Mount T Pinatubo that for a couple of years, the Earth's average temperature went down several degrees. The, the problem with solar radiation management is it has a lot of unknown, unintended consequences. You change precipitation patterns. There's very, I think, there's carbon dioxide removal does not have those same issues. But they, I think they, we should be doing the research on these now so that when we get to the point where we really are desperate, we have some solutions in our toolkit. Thank you. There's a couple of questions uh, for Jeff related to base flood elevation. So one is, is the base, uh, if the base, uh, if the BFE is 10 feet, is the building height limit of 25 feet in Belmont Shore to be waived? Do you want to talk a little bit about how that works? Fortunately, the city of Long Beach allows us to take the height limit off of the base flood elevation. So when it comes to the requirement of lifting the home uh, to that level, we get to take the height limit from that floor area. Uh, otherwise, we would have a whole bunch of squished homes that uh, nobody would really enjoy living in. <laughs> so another question asks, how will the city help renters in impacted areas? An example, um, if there's a house in front and a back, uh, an apartment in the back of the lot, and the property owner is a climate denier. Um, <laughs> hopefully that's not a specific situation we're dealing with, but if it is. Um, there really are a, an array of mitigations and adaptations that we're looking at. Um, right now, I think we have a list of about 200. You see a whole bunch of them at the boards in the back, and if you haven't visited back there, be sure to, and they'll all be showcased as well at the open house next weekend. We also know there's stuff we haven't added to the list or, or stuff we've missed, so we do want to hear from you all what else is missing. And we do have a city of 58% of our residents are renters, and so yes, we will need ways to help renters address these situations. Now, if, if someone owns the property and it's their decision of what to do with, um, whether to do physical adaptations, that's going to be a challenge, um, but certainly for renters, um, in particular things like flood event notification or similarly on the extreme heat side, those cooling centers, um, neighborhood social capital. Again, going back to the power outage a few years ago, we did have fire, you know, city fire and first response out there going door to door, but we also learned it was neighbors knowing each other and knowing who to check on that they might be worried about that really helped protect people and um, potentially save lives. And so that um, sort of individual level is going to be really important as well. And, and if you live on the peninsula, find that climate denier and sell them your house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, it is 7.30. We've got a few more questions, and then I'm going to leave a little bit of the time at the end for people um, on the feedback boards. One question, what is the Aquarium of the Pacific um, doing to prepare for higher sea level? Will the aquarium move? Well, we're just expanding, and we've looked at this very carefully. I, I figure that we are probably good for 50 or 60 years. We're, we're fortunate because we're in, in the lee of the port of Long Beach and Los Angeles, and with the billions of dollars of infrastructure investment, I don't think we're going to let those go. So we're a little bit like being the tip of Manhattan. Okay. What are the strategies being used for areas of high property value, such as Miami Beach? 
Well, you know, that, that's a, one of the most vulnerable areas in the entire United States. And um, it, it's a com it, it, politically, it's very complicated in Miami because it's the home of many climate deniers. A and uh, it isn't just, just that they're so close to sea level, but they sit on, on very porous limestone. And so th they, they really uh, should be very worried in making plans, and they're suffering from sunny day flooding off very often, and um, I, but they should do something. They should get busy. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, a lot of the uh, measures that we saw, specifically raising the home, that's what's going on most everywhere. Uh, again, when you're outside of a seismic zone, you can do a whole lot more from the standpoint of uh, options. So. Uh, some of those cities that aren't involved in earthquakes have some options that we don't have. And I think that cues up nicely another question that says, what lessons can Long Beach learn from other SoCal cities? Um, how can we combine our efforts with other nearby cities? I can speak. Well, the, the sea level rise is a global and it's a regional problem. And I think in, in many of the, in Southern California, the, at least the low-lying cities are ones that we should be collaborating with and trying to, to develop some common strategies. And uh, it, much of California's shoreline is, is backed with cliffs. That's a totally different set of issues. But in places like Long Beach and Seal Beach and, and down into Orange County, there's an awful lot of infrastructure that's vulnerable. In fact, this is one of the most, most vulnerable areas in all of California. I think we should be looking to, to collaborate with these cities. Yeah, I think that's, that's key. Uh, working together is going to get us through a lot of this. Everybody can learn from each other's uh, situations, conditions, mistakes. I think it's an important part of the communities to gather around and share information, elements that worked, elements that didn't work, and how best to uh, mitigate the uh, rising tides coming. And I, and I think if by working together, we can increase the likelihood of getting substantial funding to deal with, with this problem. There's a lot of political clout in Southern California that we don't seem to use very often. I think those are all great points, and to add on to that, um, we do you know, work closely with our council of governments and nearby cities. I know uh, we have academic institutions that help support, for example, there's the LA Regional Collaborative. Uh, the aquarium helps bring together various institutions and, and governing bodies. Um, but as our panelists have pointed out, there's a need to be talking more and, and working more together. So I think that's a really great point. Another comment um, is about flood insurance. The question is, is it cost effective? Should we pursue it? I know. Go ahead. Uh, to be honest, I don't know too much about flood insurance specifically. Uh, I think Clay in the background there for, um, from SmartVent could probably answer some more, more specific questions. Uh, it's my understanding that if you're in a flood zone, you will be paying flood insurance. Uh, the cost of that insurance is based off of the mitigation techniques that are in place of your home, uh, the elevation of your home, as well as uh, the conditions around the actual foundation and everything else. As you implement more of these elements, uh, I'm told that the insurance premiums will go down. Uh, it's very dependent on those measures that are actually in place and uh, other conditions out there as well. So. I'd uh, recommend hitting up Clay in the back and uh, seeing if he might be able to help out. One of the issues with flood insurance in many states is you will be compensated to rebuild your home, but only if you do it exactly where it was before the flood. And that's the wrong thing to do. And that's what happened in New Orleans following Sandy, or Katrina, rather. Thank you. There's another question. Um, if greenhouse gases are the primary driver of climate change and the um, attendant sea level rise, uh, why isn't the city sharing GHG emission data from oil production in the city? And I know that was a, a written comment we also got from uh, the, the 350 chapter for Long Beach. And so we are working with our um, 
our technical team to do some of that analysis since that is of interest. So we're working on it now. We don't have all the answers yet, but um, as soon as we do, we'll be sharing them publicly. So thank you for that question. Um, there's another question about who decides what the most cost-effective measures should be. Um, I think that's a really great question, and um, I can say, you know, we, we are leaning on some of our technical experts, but we do want to also hear from the public. One of the ways that we want people to prioritize and look at measures is about cost-effectiveness. Sometimes when you look at different assessments, cost-effectiveness really varies in terms of who's doing the assessment and what the local conditions are, so the panelists may have some more thoughts on that, um, but we do need that expert um, insight, but we also do need to hear from folks. Anything else to add there? Cost effectiveness is paralleled with durability and how, how well that measure is actually going to help the conditions. Uh, a lot of these things that we've talked about this evening from the standpoint of uh, getting your home prepared are expensive and some of them aren't so expensive. So it kind of depends on what your comfort level is with respect to how much you want to spend to protect your home. Great, so the last question I've got up here and then I'll, I'll let um, our panelists give quick closing comments. Um, so it says, please clarify what we should expect on Naples and Belmont Shore 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now in terms of flood incidents and inundation. Surges, flood heights, water heights, infrastructure issues. Um, we can look a lot more specifically if, um, if the person asking the question wants to come to the back and anyone else interested. I'll also let Dr. Schubel answer on this, but um, I mentioned briefly that our projections um, shown on the map show um, temporary inundation from king tides, which happen maybe once or twice a year, as early as 2030, and then also um, in 2050. And it's with that mid-range 2100 estimate that we see what are called daily high tide inundations. Um, we're looking at more specifics in terms of um, heights. That's a lot harder to do on a large scale. So much of the work ahead of us will be looking at specific assets and um, you as community members looking at your own assets to figure out some of that detailed analysis. Right now it's just a big picture, where should we focus our efforts? And then getting into that more detailed, but we do have critical infrastructure impacted as early as 2030, for example. We have a, a fire station um, and some, some transportation infrastructure that could be vulnerable. And then as we get to the further years, you'll see many more, not just buildings, but also critical infrastructure, whether it's our stormwater or wastewater assets, um, as well as potable water assets, uh, transportation and energy infrastructure um, that are all really critical to the services that the city delivers. So any additional thoughts on that? I would just, I would accelerate everything that you, you've said. Recent data would suggest, for example, I don't know what the maximum sea level rise you have for 2100, uh, but it's probably two or three feet. But, 66 and so five and a half. And, and as I mentioned in the most recent data, it could be seven to 10 feet by 2100. That totally changes the dynamic. You know, it, 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 you, a few extra inches makes a big difference. And so I guess I, I think we might have to look at accelerating all of those patterns that are in, in the back. Yeah, I don't know that this is really my domain, but uh, the infrastructure itself is is critical. It feeds all of our homes. Uh, I think there's some pretty strict measures that need to be considered at uh, the water utilities, uh, uh, electric utilities, sewer lines, and all these companies that are providing us our utilities themselves really need to focus their attention on what this looks like. Uh, both in the short term and in the long term. And I don't know where they are with that, but I'm hoping that they're paying attention to what we've uh, discussed tonight. 
Yeah, and I'll just add a couple of quick things. I think we all know that it only takes one or two flood events to cause a lot of damage to an asset. And so whether it's once a year or twice a year or, you know, two inches or five, you know, as we think about those details, they will be important. We don't know for certain. As we talked about, no one has um, all the answers. But as Dr. Schubel has reinforced tonight, we only know this issue is accelerating. The data and maps we have here today are just to give us kind of a starting point based on the best available data and science that we've had um, you know, as we've gone through this process. But this is just a starting point. This is just the process where we begin to identify what are the mitigations, what are the adaptations, whether it's changes to our regulations, whether it's changes to our um, codes or different kinds of incentives for residents and businesses. You know, it's going to take a little bit of everything and all of us working together to really address these issues. And um, we don't have all the answers. That's part of why we wanted to bring together this expert panel and also engage all of you in this conversation because uh, this is going to be a critical issue tomorrow and 10 years and 30 years down the road. So with that, I'll leave it for any uh, quick closing comments. And I do urge you all, if you haven't already, to look at our vulnerability maps in the back and on the back right to weigh in on any of the measures you see that we're already considering. Add post-it notes with additional measures you think we should consider. And I hope you'll join us next Saturday for our open house as well. We really appreciate you coming out on a rainy evening. Anyone have anything else to add? I would just say to reinforce, you know, this is a global problem that, that we're facing, and I think that uh, Long Beach is a remarkable city. I, I, I like to think of it as we're the little city that could. We're small enough to be manageable. You don't, get caught, have, you don't have to get caught up in all the bureaucracy. We ought to develop a model for how a Southern California coastal city can thrive in the face of a rising sea. Well said. Uh, Long Beach, uh, for as long as I have known, has always been a pro progressive city with respect to trying to mitigate conditions that, uh, that arise unexpectedly and expectedly. So when it comes down to uh, preparing, I think the best thing that we can do is not wait. The worst thing we can do is just sit and, and stay idle and wait for the flood to come. And then everybody's running to Home Depot. Nothing's there and then we're in a world of hurt. So the idea of this whole thing is to really think proactively and consider a lot of the measures and discussions that we've, we've discussed today and uh, get out there and prepare yourselves. If you haven't already, make sure you grab a save the date for our open house next weekend. On the back is our website that has everything you've seen tonight and a whole bunch more information. Thanks again and hope to see you in the back.